and welcome to this month's Insight. When we look back over our lives, it is often the moments of love that we've shared with those close to us that mean the most. Nowadays, in a world where families seem to be multiplying and dividing at a faster rate than ever before, nothing can take the place of sharing the gift of love with another, whether it be between friends, between a woman and a man, or between a parent and a child. Internationally loved teacher and lecturer Leo Bastaglia has devoted his life to the appreciation and encouragement of family love and affection. And inside this month, Leo celebrates fatherhood by sharing his own personal memories and by reminding us how ordinary events and relationships enrich our lives. And now, in tribute to all fathers, Leo Bastaglia tells of the one he knew best in two remembrances. The first about Papa the Patriot, and the second about Papa the Philanthropist. Papa was always first in line at the polling place. He never missed an election. Nothing short of a catastrophe could keep him away. When the doors opened at 7 a.m., there he was, waiting to be the first to enter. For a time, being first to vote became a contest between Papa and his good friend Arne Goldstein, a Jewish immigrant from Poland. It seemed to represent something very special to both of them. To my knowledge, it was always a friendly sort of competition, as each one attempted to arrive earlier than the other. But Arne finally gave up. When Papa first came to the United States, his destination was Gallup, New Mexico, where there was work to be had in the mine. He had been preceded by his brother and assured of a job. Like so many immigrants bound for America at the turn of the century, my father was induced to leave his homeland for a well-paying, steady job. Dreams of a better life took form even in remote villages such as Papa's, as stories of golden opportunities were spread. In Papa's case, he departed from his new wife and a one-year-old child, leaving behind the only way of life he had ever known. But it seemed to him worth the separation if it meant an escape from a vicious cycle of poverty and exploitation. A hope for a better life beckoned him halfway around the world. The plan was that Papa would go to America and work hard until he had accumulated enough money to send for his family. His long-term plan was to amass a small fortune, buy a home, educate his children, then return to his small village to live out his years in security and dignity. That was the scenario for so many immigrants. But it did not quite work out that way, either for Papa or for most others. The majority of immigrants never went home again. The United States became their permanent home. Their dreams eventually faded into nostalgia for their homeland, expressed plaintively on cold winter nights or during long, hot summers. They lived out their days in a love-hate relationship with the old world and the new. And so it was with Papa. The stark reality of the damp, dark mines of New Mexico hardly proved the opportunity Papa had envisioned. It wasn't long before he and his brother borrowed some money and set off. They arrived in the Plaza de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles with 67 cents between them, unable to speak English and friendless. Papa always told us the story, astounding but true, of how they wandered, lost, near the train station, trying to figure out their next move. Then came a miracle. They encountered a man from their Italian village. To meet someone at such a time in such a place from a town with a population of fewer than 200 inhabitants had to be something more than coincidence. Their friend took them home, fed them, and assured them that he'd take care of them until they found jobs. The next day, they found positions as dishwashers in a small restaurant on North Broadway in downtown Los Angeles. Soon, Papa was promoted to waiter and finally became the major D. Mom arrived in Los Angeles a year later, a frightened young woman with a small child in her arms. She had to be detained on Ellis Island until her son got over the measles. When she was finally allowed to enter the country, she was no longer sure she would be met by Papa. She feared that he had given up, but Papa met every train from New York 
For the long weeks that it took Mama to finally descend into his arms at the train station in Los Angeles, I have never ceased to be overwhelmed by the courage of my parents. They were so young when they came to America, so naive, never having been out of their rural village, speaking not a word of English, and with only a pittance in their pockets. Things began to reverse themselves after Mama's arrival. She took over the management of their modest two-room house, her first real home. She took in washing and ironing, and like Papa, she worked day and night. At times, it must have seemed to them that they were once again trapped in their old lifestyle. What kept them going was the inner knowledge that they were working together for a better life and, for the first time, a decent wage. It wasn't long before more children came along, a larger home, and finally, a newfound feeling of security. I was about 16 when Papa announced that he was going to apply for American citizenship. What had delayed the decision for so many years was the English fluency requirement that a citizen had to fulfill. Having gotten by for years with imperfect English, he nonetheless decided to formally upgrade his language skills. He joined a night class at the local elementary school and prepared in earnest to take the naturalization exam. It was wonderful that Papa, who'd loved learning and been denied an education when he was young, could in middle age return to the classroom. His excitement and pleasure were obvious. Immediately he bought a large notebook, writing paper and a dictionary. He picked his clothes for the first night of school with great care. He even got a haircut for the occasion. On that important evening, he rushed through dinner, which was, of course, unheard of, put on a suit and tie, picked up his notebook, kissed Mama goodbye, as if he were setting off on a six-week cruise, and left. Papa loved being a student. Every evening after dinner, he would gather his books and papers and settle in to do his homework. Papa was far more diligent than his children and he was continually appalled by how little we knew about our country. What did they teach you in school, he'd ask angrily. He'd warn us, you should know your rights so no one can take them away from you. It wasn't long before Papa could recite the Pledge of Allegiance and the preamble to the Constitution. He memorized the Bill of Rights, and much to our amazement, learned the names in order of the first 30 presidents of the United States. He knew all the states and their capitals. He could tell you the most important signers of the Declaration of Independence, as well as endless lists of historic dates, names, and places. He insisted that we quiz him in every spare moment, rattling off the answers before we could finish the question. Who discovered America? Cristoforo Colombo in 1492. Who were the first inhabitants of America? Los Indianos. Who were the pilgrims? Some of nice people who came like me and Mama to America on a boat, the Mayflower, in 1620. His favorite question was, what is a democracy? I think he liked the rhythm of the answer as much as he did the idea. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. He would use his newfound knowledge to enrich casual conversations with family and friends. Don't forget, he'd remind them, this is a government of the people, and by the people, and for the people. Papa loved his teacher and was very popular in his citizenship class. He was continually winning awards of merit. He was given a certificate for being the only member of his class who could recite the Gettysburg Address without a single error. He received a medal, honorable mention, for his short speech titled, Why I Came to America. At last, Papa was ready for his final exam. This was, as I still remember, a tense time in our household. For days prior to his having to appear at the Los Angeles Federal Building for his exam, we all walked on eggs. We all looked to Papa's eyes to tell us whether it was a time for levity or a time for silence. It was with a great sense of relief that we watched Papa leave the house with his required two witnesses at his side to take the exam. No sooner had he left than Mama started praying, rosaries to our blessed mother, special vows to our blessed Father, flowers and candles to a myriad of saints. You don't have to pray, Mama, we assured her. Papa knows everything. He knows more than the judge. We wouldn't allow ourselves even to imagine what life would be like if Papa failed to pass. Happily, when he returned a few hours later, his face shone with the unmistakable light of success. 
I can still picture him striding triumphantly up the walkway in what was undoubtedly one of his proudest moments. Papa attributed his success to having studied long and hard. Mama knew better. Though she never dared mention it to Papa, she was convinced that God had been responsible. Be that as it may, Papa's victory was made all the sweeter because the examiner had actually singled him out for special recognition. He commented on Papa's fine preparation and had suggested that he was going to make an outstanding citizen. Even with this honor, Papa was disappointed that he'd not been asked enough questions. After all his studying, anxiety, and worry, only three things were asked of him. What is the highest court of the land? Who was the third president of the United States? And what is a democracy? His preface to each of these responses, according to his witnesses, was, ah, oh, that's an easy one. To celebrate his success, Papa took everyone out to dinner. This was seldom done in our family. But on this special occasion, he gathered up his teacher, his best friend from class, Mr. Goldstein, and the whole family for a graduation party of sorts. And in keeping with his new status, I remember Papa discussing with Mr. Goldstein how they would vote in the next election. The swearing-in ceremony was all that was left to make Papa, at last, a real citizen. With hundreds of others, he was required to take the oath of allegiance. We all dressed in our Sunday go-to-church outfit, squeezed into our dilapidated car, and drove to the courthouse downtown where the final ceremony was scheduled. I remember very little about the ceremony itself, except for the moment when Papa spotted us in a sea of spectators and waved happily. Later, after we all hugged him with loving congratulations, he said, you see, I'm an American now. He paused for a moment and became very pensive. Then he added, of Italian descent. And that was true of Papa forever. People were always drawn to Papa. Men, women, children, even animals. The one thing he didn't attract was money. He was one of those individuals who, in spite of his intelligence and ambition, worked hard all of his life without ever achieving financial success. He started working as a child, and except for a few brief holidays, now and again, never stopped working until he was in his late 60s. He had jobs in noisy factories, greasy kitchens, crowded hotels, and frenzied restaurants. Though he was a constantly valued employee, he was always somehow passed over at promotion time. Twice he started his own business, and both times they were successes. But both times the partners whom he trusted found means of easing him out or absconding with the profits, leaving him with accumulated debt. Papa was forever considered too generous. It was a common thing to hear people say of him, ah, oh, he's too good, he's not aggressive enough, he's too meek, and in America the meek don't inherit much of anything, let alone the earth. I remember some difficult times when I was growing up, times when we questioned whether we'd have enough food to eat or be able to meet the monthly bills. But I never recall being hungry, and never at any time did it occur to me that Papa might be a failure. For Papa, giving was a way of life. He loved to give. The things that he owned never seemed to weigh him down the way they do most people. In fact, Friends had to be careful not to express a desire for something that was his to give, the tie around his neck or the picture on his wall, or he would surely find a way to give it to them. Papa didn't understand money. He was never sure what to do with it, especially how to use it as a tool for making more. To him, the greatest gifts had nothing to do with money. He gave of himself, his love, his time. He was always ready with a listening ear and encouraging hug a well-timed visit, a glass of his homemade wine, and whatever he had reaped from his plentiful harvest from his garden. Fruit, flowers, vegetables, including the ubiquitous zucchini. Anyone who's ever tried a hand at gardening knows that there is no more rewarding plant than the zucchini. It takes little care, looks beautiful, and even produces an edible bloom that when fried in butter is food for the gods. In addition, its yield is endless. Papa harvested his zucchini very early when the squash were small, thin, and tender. 
That was when he felt they were most flavorful. The quality was surpassed only by their quantity, for no matter how many he picked, there were always more. Thanks to his bounty, Papa gathered enough for tea to feed a small nation. He'd clean them, separate them by size, and get ready for his round. The most tender of the crop were designated as the ones to be given away. Those that managed to hide under the bushes and had grown to gargantuan size were for our table. But we were not to be pitied. Over the years, Mama had learned how to plan for the bumper crop. She would fry them, steam them, mash them, and stuff them. The possibilities were endless. When we got to the point when one more bite of zucchini might turn us into one, she disguised them in casseroles and mixed them with fruit and nuts, raked them into a frittata with eggs and garlic, julienne them into an antipasto, or throw them into the minestrone pot. Nothing in our house was ever wasted. But the biggest challenge was always the zucchini. It was the kind of challenge Mama was always ready for. Papa had a regular zucchini route. He portioned off the precious vegetables according to the needs of our neighbors their family size and gourmet taste. Six for this family, five for this, and nine for this, until the entire neighborhood was supplied. Though Papa loved sharing the fruits of his labors, it was not always appreciated. Especially was this true of the young kids in the neighborhood who hated vegetables and for whom zucchini was the most distasteful. As my father visited each house in turn, disappearing through the front door with his bounty in hand, the kids would surround me and threaten me with violence if my father didn't stop giving their parents those awful green things. They assured me that if I didn't do something to curb his generosity, I'd surely be sorry. I knew this wasn't an idle threat either. Tony, Chester, and Teddy were all twice my size. Never did I feel so vulnerable caught between Papa's generosity and the wrath of the kids on the block. Please, Papa, I plead, don't take zucchini to the neighbors. Why not? Because they hate them, I try to explain. You crazy, nobody hates zucchini. He dismissed the idea. Papa's giving wasn't limited to vegetables. He was a soft touch for every beggar in town. It could be me, you know, he'd say, dropping a few precious coins into a hat. He always had a cold drink ready for the mail carrier or the meter reader. He's out all day in the hot sun, he'd say. His job isn't easy. He was ready with a bunch of flowers for Mrs. V, confined to her bed with an illness. She's all alone. She needs pretty things around. It'll make her feel better. Maybe, who knows, she'll visit me someday when I'm sick. He would prepare a bottle of wine for the visiting teacher, much to our horror and embarrassment. It'll help her when she has to read all those papers. There was ravioli for the librarian. She gives us all those books free. We can give her a few ravioli. They'll be good for her, and she's too skinny anyway. I must admit that at the time, Papa's giving was a source of great embarrassment to me. No other father in the neighborhood went door to door with zucchini or gave wine to the teacher. Why couldn't my Papa be like other fathers and just not be so visible? Why did he have to be so prominent in the neighborhood? But as I matured, I began to notice a very interesting phenomenon. It was only Papa whose mail was delivered hand to hand. It was only Papa who was warmly greeted by everyone from the trash collector to the local butcher. It was always Papa who got first choice of the new Italian books at the library. I don't think I ever heard anyone speak ill of Papa. Statements about his softness, meekness, and excessive goodness were heard, in time more like compliments than criticism. Philanthropy is often equated with money or wealth. Still, the dictionary definition of the word is simply one who shows goodwill toward all, whose actions and efforts are directed toward promoting human welfare. The word has its roots in the Greek language meaning love for mankind. If this is so, then Papa was certainly among the world's greatest, albeit poorest, philanthropists. That was Leo Buscaglia, whose heartfelt memories of Papa remind us to appreciate the nurturers in our lives. And now, here's some fatherly counsel from the Dean of Personal Development, Earl Nightingale.
If people expect someone to be funny, they'll laugh at practically anything he says. In the days when Mark Twain was lecturing around the country, he was unquestionably the funniest speaker in the country. But looking just below the surface of everything he said was his terrible burning rage at all manner of ignorance and sham. One evening he began his lecture by saying that he could not be very humorous that evening because his mother had just passed away. The entire audience roared, thinking that he was joking. They knew he was funny. They expected him to be funny, and they would have laughed if he had told them that the theater was on fire. I was reminded of that by the book Long Time No See, a collection of the lectures delivered by the Chinese-born professor, Dr. No Yong Park. The professor also has some comments on how to find happiness in an affluent society. If you accept the thesis that contrast creates pleasure and pain, says Dr. No Young Park, it is not difficult to find a way to happiness. If you want to enjoy sunshine, first suffer some rain or snow. If you want to enjoy a mild spring, first suffer a cold, bleak winter. If you want to enjoy a good vacation, study and work hard and earn it. If you want to enjoy a hearty meal, First, work hard and burn up your energy and grow hungry. If you want a good night's sleep, work or exercise strenuously and become tired and sleepy. When you're tired and sleepy, you don't need sleeping pills or an inner spring mattress. You can get the best of sleep on a cement floor. When you find life in our own country dull and miserable, go away somewhere, preferably to a communist country or to some primitive undeveloped country in Africa or Asia, and live there. Not just a day or a week as a tourist, but months and years as the natives do, without all the rights and privileges, comforts and luxuries which you and I take for granted every day. I assure you, he says, that you will find the greatest joy and happiness under your own flag and your own roof. I recall a remark made by one of our soldiers who had served in Southeast Asia. He said that the most beautiful sight he had ever seen anywhere in the whole world was the Golden Gate Bridge as viewed from aboard the ship that safely brought him back to his own land. He added that for the first time in his life, our country was so dear to him that he shed tears of joy and gratitude. Helen Keller said that people could be happier if they somehow could manage to become blind, deaf, and dumb a few days of their lives. People who really enjoy good weather are those who live where there are cold winters. People who live in a warm, sunny climate all year round seldom think about it or really enjoy it. Nothing could be worse than life as a never-ending bowl of cherries, cherries for breakfast, lunch and dinner. People who enjoy a good income are those who were once poor, and they're in many ways much more fortunate than those born into wealthy families. Dr. No Young Park says, when you're grouchy and dissatisfied with life, shut your eyes and imagine that you've lost everything. All your loved ones, your cherished possessions, your rights and privileges. If you still don't feel happy, maybe you don't deserve happiness. I saw a very clever poster the other morning. It read, have you ever noticed how when products compete with each other, they get better? And on the poster was an illustration of two crudely hand lettered signs. One read, Betty's Lemonade, and the other read, Arnie's Lemonade, with a cherry, spelled C-H-E-A-R-Y, and there was a childishly drawn cherry on the sign. And the truth of this clever illustration reminded me of a story. Once upon a time, there was a very successful grocery store chain. We'll call it the XYZ Company. And it grew bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it covered the whole country. It succeeded because it did the best job in bringing food products to the customers, no matter where they lived, big city or small town. And, of course, it made many millions and millions of dollars. This went on for years, and each year there were more and more XYZ stores. And finally, it got so big, it just dominated the grocery store business. And naturally, everybody who packed or manufactured a food product wanted to use products sold in these stores. And so the XYZ stores were able to offer the customer a wonderful variety of products, each competing with the others for shelf space and the loyalty of the customer. And the company waxed fat and successful. But finally, it became so big, somebody in the company said, Look here, 
Why should we help all these food producers and processors make all the money they're making? Why don't we make that extra margin ourselves? Let's start producing all those things ourselves, since we have this food business pretty well wrapped up all over the country. Terrific idea, said one of the other top officials of the company. And so it came to pass that the XYZ company started buying up small food producers and building its own plants and producing products under its own XYZ brand label. What it didn't produce itself, it forced the various suppliers to produce under the XYZ brand too, until finally you could hardly find an item in its stores that didn't have its name on it. It seemed like a good idea. After all, the XYZ stores had many millions of customers. But then a curious thing happened. A year came along when the company's profits, instead of getting larger, as was expected, actually were smaller. And this was a baffling turn of events, since the economy was expanding and the population was increasing and wages were going up. And the next year, profits were smaller still, and pretty soon a year came along in which this great far-flung company actually lost money, went into the red for the first time in many, many years. And during these years of declining profits, the company didn't have the money or the wisdom to keep improving its stores, and so it sort of fell behind at times. And all the other grocery stores, which had once lived in fear of being swallowed up by this giant of a company, found their sales volumes and profits climbing. And so they built bigger and cleaner and more beautiful stores. And in each of these stores, the customer had a wonderful variety of products and brand names from which to choose. A shopper didn't have to buy one brand. He or she had a choice of competing brands, each trying to outshine the other. And the moral of our little story is, don't get so big and successful that you forget what made it all work in the beginning. Or, when you think you have the customer in your hip pocket in this country, you're getting too big for your britches, and you're liable to lose them both. Let me stretch your mind with a great quotation. It goes like this. It is an incontestable truth that man is enclosed in the environment he creates and so bound by the limitations he sets himself. He lives in the atmosphere to which he belongs and in the sphere of his own imagination. You know that if more people understood this great truth, they'd stop complaining about things. They'd realize that the world's their own creation. And if they feel they can stand some improvements, it's up to them to do something about it. All of us live in the atmosphere to which we belong because it's the atmosphere we settled for. To complain about it is as absurd as jumping into a river and then complaining about being wet. I've said before that if the average person realized the power he wields over his own life and destiny, he would live in a perpetual state of wonder and thanksgiving. He's as free as his imagination. He's limited only by the fences he himself erects and maintains. It reminds me of a story I read one time about a man who came into a room and found a bee buzzing against the window pane. The little thing was banging its head against the glass while the window through which it had entered was wide open nearby. The man tried to see the bee toward the open window, but the bee only became angrier in its phony self-imposed prison. Finally, the man took a heavy cloth and caught the bee, nearly crushing it, and was able to force its freedom upon it before it succeeded in killing itself or stinging the hand that was trying to free it. And then the man thought, how like that bee are we humans? We're troubled with the thought of lack in the presence of the world's bounty. We're given complete freedom, and we immediately wall ourselves into small little worlds and then complain because the whole world isn't ours. We want more, but we refuse to do more in order to earn or justify it. We want opportunity, we say, but even while we say it, we're clinging with both hands to whatever shaky security we can find. We want more knowledge, but we don't like to study. We like a better job, but we don't prepare for it. We want the love and respect of others, but withhold our own. It all seems to hinge on our unwillingness to be honest with ourselves. We're quick to blame all others, but find alibis for ourselves when we do the same things. As the man said, it's an incontestable truth that man is enclosed in the environment he creates and so bound by the limitations he sets himself. 
Maybe it's time a lot of us stand up, shake loose the phantom chains, and move out. It's a difficult job to escape from the prison we ourselves fashion, but it can be done. And there's no one to shoot at us if we do, or try to take us back. It's worth the effort. That was Earl Nightingale. And now, please turn this cassette over to hear Mike Wicket on side two. Thank <laughs> you.